Now, having spent much time talking about weather, we move on to essentially what is the aggregate or long-term averaging of our weather uh, to look at different climate types and how we designate them. So we can see a variety of climate types here, uh, really as we'll kind of tie that to biomes in a future lecture as well, into like thinking about vegetation types. We can see uh, from the upper left-hand corner example from more of a desert type of landscape on the bottom, kind of a tropical rainforest uh, landscape or climate, and then on the top right, kind of almost a tundra and or mountainous uh, highland environment or climate. And so if you've been to uh, many of these places, you know, we've been to a wide variety of places. Um, you know, our song, kind of perhaps fittingly then, uh, to help us get in the mood for this lecture is I've Been Everywhere by Johnny Cash, because if you've been everywhere, you've seen all sorts of these climate types we're going to be talking about. So again, just to differentiate between, we spend quite a bit of all this time talking about weather, and that being really, again, our day-to-day, -day, you know, what we're experiencing in the present uh, atmospheric type of conditions based around things like humidity and precipitation, or lack of precipitation, um, or whatever, you know, in kind of the heat or, you know, temperature aspects uh, that we've talked about. But really, the climate is that long-term averaging of weather over time. So it's even including variability, including extremes. Um, and to note that both weather and climate are dynamic, and we talked about how weather patterns can change over time. You know, or, you know if you check the weather daily, perhaps, or you know, check it, what it's going to generally be for the next several days, other you know, typical type of weather patterns you usually get, perhaps uh, in seasons uh, throughout the year, but again, climate is also, as we'll see in a future lecture, also within that realm. It does change over time, or longer time periods, and we'll be exploring that as well in a future lecture. So but what we're, we want to focus on here for this lesson and lecture is simply focusing on how do we actually go about designating these areas that have similar weather statistics over time, and essentially how do we create a basis for climate classification. So because we can think of, you know, an ideal climate classification system is going to achieve several objectives. It's going to clearly differentiate among different types of climates. It's going to show the relationship between them. Hopefully you should be able to apply it across Earth uh, everywhere. And, you know, it also needs to be a framework to divide between specific locations and demonstrate that, you know, really, to some extent, how is there a difference between these types of climates. And so there's a variety of different climate classifications that have been developed over time and have a wide variety of use. The type that we're going to be focusing on in this lecture and lesson is one of the most popular that is used uh, frequently in geography and kind of across a variety of environmental sciences that is known as the Kepin classification system. As we can see, there's several different types here. There's from tropical climates, to, uh, dry climates, mid-latitude or mesothermal climates, uh, more uh, higher latitude mid-latitude or microthermal climates, polar climates, and highland climates. So you can see their letter designations there as well. Um, and we'll go, be working through that. And so you can see this differentiation in their different types here. Um, and again, really breaking this all down based on two main characteristics, our temperature and our precipitation characteristics of these places, are really the two drivers that we're seeing here um, that are implemented in these differences in designation as we'll be walking through uh, kind of each individual aspect. And again, this is in, in turn tied to a, a number of the weather kind of broader climatic controls we've already discussed. So we spent time talking about insulation and net radiation, land water heating differences, specific heat, right, uh, sensible and latent heat. You know, we've talked about the intertropical convergence zone, subtropical high pressure cells, generally tied to that, you know, more broadly low and high pressure areas, you know, wind patterns, elevation, air masses, humidity, water vapor, all these things are going to be important as we go through. And so you know, we're going to be talking through, through kind of in, in, at least in, in brief, all these different climate types. And you know, what I want us to focus on is not necessarily memorizing more of those temperature ranges of, you know, in, in our precipitation ranges for all these different breakdown of climate types within this specific system, because I don't think that works. But again, I want to tie it back to our broader goal of really linking the process uh, to the pattern. So thinking about what are the processes in any of these climate types or you know classifications that we're going to see, and what are the main processes that are driving the observations of you know the long-term patterns of temperature and precipitation that we're seeing in those places. That is what I want you to focus on um, and be able to take away from this lesson going forward. 
So without further ado then, we can look at our broad map of our Kepin classification. Um, of course, this is throwing everything all at you at once. Um, and you, you'll be able to go back and look at these lecture slides individually. But it really will start working through it kind of from the tropics up to the poles, uh, more or less. As so we can see, our variety of tropical climate types here. And then we'll go through some of these individually. So our, here's our specifically just tropical rainforest climate. And so if we go to and actually look at uh, its characteristics over time and for its locations, so usually we're seeing these occur right around the equator within about 10 to 15 degrees north or south of the equator. And we're going to be using these, what we can term climographs or climate graphs on the right hand side here. And we'll be looking through these. And so this is showing our, both our temperature ranges uh, kind of on the top here. So what are the max and minimum temperatures? And that's kind of the range of temperatures that we get throughout a year, starting from January going to December. And then kind of similarly from the bottom, what is the precipitation as we can see down here? So our, all these are going to be average maximum temperatures in degrees Celsius and the precipitation totals in millimeters. Uh, and so we can see here with our tropical rainforest climates that really our temperature range is pretty low throughout the whole year. And uh, we have a high average uh, temperature uh, really throughout that time as well. And, uh, you know, that high and average pretty consistent uh, precipitation throughout the year. And so again, the question that I always want to bring us back to is, well, well, why is this? What are the processes? Can we think of some of the processes here if we actually pause for a second, think about what have we already talked about in some of those processes that I just covered a couple of slides ago, you know, that are leading to what we're seeing here. So can you think of any, can, you know, if you stop and think, what um, are we seeing here? Hopefully you can make it to this point of thinking, okay, well, I remember in you know, the sun angle, we've talked about insulation with our right, and being in the tropics, right, there's not going to be a large range of temperatures because the sun angle is directly overhead or pretty close to directly overhead throughout the year, all around, right in the, you know, right around the equator and in the tropics. And then, you know, similarly, you know, if we're asking, well, why do we really see those high amounts of rainfall throughout the year, right, this is, you know, where we're seeing these areas of tropical rainforest is where we have the intertropical convergence zone or that band of low pressure that's really influencing it throughout the year. You know, it's really not ever drifting too far away. There's always lots of low pressure bringing in lots of really warm moisture laden air, causing it to rise, precipitate out, uh, you know, a lot of that moisture. And so you know, it's these areas that are sun angle directly overhead, not causing much range. Uh, the intertropical convergence zone brings lots of precipitation. Um, and so, you know, we're not gonna be uh, showing too many vegetation pictures in this. We're gonna come back to that in biomes as well, but just some examples here. Uh, that I've included as well for you. Um, but to move on then uh, to our other tropical types, so our tropical monsoon climate, as you can see some distribution of here, as well as tropical savanna climate uh, shown here. So kind of if we flip back and forth for those, we see again largely within the tropics uh, at their distribution as well. Um, it's a little bit higher, maybe uh, the 10 to 15 to 20 ish, even to, up to 25 degrees north and south latitude. I can drop generally remaining within those a little bit higher latitudes of the tropics. Um, and so just to differentiate them as well, to note that you know, it's really the, tro the tropical monsoon versus the tropical savanna. Really the tropical savanna um, is a little bit drier, has, uh, you know, sees a little bit less um, precipitation. It's kind of the draw the line that is drawn. And we can see here from some of the climographs kind of ranged and really seasonal variation. So this example, our tropical monsoon, where you get um, a large amount of precipitation throughout part of the year, and a little bit less in some cases, um, and seasonal difference um, in other locations. But we can see, really, again, the temperature range is fairly low still. Um, you know, it's still pretty high average temperature throughout the year, and, and you know, we have more of a, just a seasonal variation in precipitation. So again, well, why is this? And what are the processes here? Um, and, you know, if we think back to our names, well, what does monsoon mean, right? And we just talk about monsoons. And so, you know, it's really the same process that we just talked about with tropical rainforest, yet now, you know, we're, we're bringing in that idea of the Hadley cells, right? Really what we're seeing here is this kind of seasonal impact, you know, part of the year with the monsoon by that intertropical convergence zone brings lots of moisture, but then part of the year, really that subtropical high pressure, I remember high pressure usually bring warm, not only warm, but still relatively warm temperatures, but, um, you know, that warm descending air you know, it's really going to be dry air, um, so creating very dry conditions relatively uh, throughout that time period, right? Because our monsoon, meaning that change in wind direction, so really that you 
know, as we saw with in the case of India prior, and just bring back this GIF again to show us an example where really we get the seasonal variation of precipitation due to our shifting wind patterns, right? And so then, you know, again, I won't focus too much on the vegetation here, but it's to show some examples uh, of what some of these climate types might look like. So now we move a little bit more out of the tropics, um, explore a variety of climate types more in subtropical areas. Um, and one of the main types that we see much in the subtropics, but also uh, to some extent into the mid latitudes, are different desert types. Uh, so, and mainly within the subtropics, uh, we see our hot desert climate. Um, and really, you know, when we actually look at the observations here, now we're starting to see a greater temperature range uh, throughout the year. You know, um, we see you know, a variation of much greater temperature range um, in terms of you know, from hot to cold, you know, the, the, the temperature maximum to minimum within any given month is a lot greater. Um, you know, and starting to see more variation, again, based on you know, that sun angle changing a little bit more throughout the year. Um, but of course, as we're seeing, really no precipitation uh, really at all in some of these hot desert climates generally. And so again, why? What are the processes here? You know, why are we seeing a greater range uh, than uh, temperature range than our tropical climates generally? And also, you know, what's the deal with so little precipitation? You know, can we think of some of these processes, uh, some of which we were just talking about, that are important here? So again, we're now essentially being impacted more year round by the subtropical high pressure of the Hadley, Hadley cells, which really, you know, about these 30 degrees north, 25 to 30 degrees up to low 30 degrees north and south, as we can see, that's where we find that large distribution of our uh, hot lat or hot uh, desert climates here. And so it's really, you know, we're seeing that great range of temperature even uh, in these locations because really there's no moisture in the atmosphere or you know, on the land. So that means really all our heat uh, is going into that sensible heating, you know, really that if we think back to our land water heating differences, you know, that land is heating up and cooling off very quickly. I mean, as the sun comes up, very close to overhead, heats it up very quickly. But then as the sun goes down, you know, even in any given day, you know, it can cool off very rapidly as well. Um, similarly, in our cold desert climates, so we moved to looking at some of the distribution here. Um, we do have still some of that impact um, in terms of the um, you know, high pressure cells being important seasonally. Um, you know, again, we're seeing quite a large range of temperature. We're just starting to see, you know, much uh, um, range of temperature within any given month, but also a, a greater range or you know, variation of temperature throughout a year as well. Again, as that sun angle is varying more throughout the year. Um, and again, really not much precipitation here. Um, it, you know, that's not only now necessarily due to high pressure, but it can be due to other factors that we've talked about as well. So just to take us to the most extreme example of this, um, really where we see all of this happening together, so we have the Atacama Desert, which is in Chile, in South America. And really, you know, this is the driest place in the world, even drier to, to some extent than uh, Antarctica, you know, this very essentially Arctic desert. Um, you know, but the Atacama is actually really the driest place in the world, you know, as, as weather stations that have never seen um, measured precipitation, um, not only because of you know, in some influence of subtropical high pressure, but also it's on the leeward side of the Andes Mountains. So again, as we talked about the rain shadow effect prior, um, and it's also influenced by, in part by a cold ocean current kind of off the coast uh, from where it is. And so and again, like all of our heat that is gained or lost is a sensible heat and has some constant moisture deficit throughout the whole year that really allows uh, almost no vegetation growth, as we can see from this image here. And we see um, across our really driest deserts of the world. So just to shift a little bit now and back and as we move towards the direction of having at least more moisture in our environments, to also look at semi-arid climates. Um, and to note here, um, just you know, really with these, whether it is a hot semi-arid climate or a uh, cold semi-arid climate, as you can see once again, flipping kind of back and forth between these, um, where these hot semi-arid climates kind of occurring on the margins of those hot deserts um, and kind of similarly cold semi-arid climates around the same types of areas as some of the cold deserts but kind of being the in-between between the very most extreme of those deserts that are the very driest 
um, but you know, really impacted some of those same processes as we saw, but just um, you know, maybe receiving kind of more moisture in parts of the year, and they're kind of in between those deserts and then more humid or um, locations or types of climates that have more moisture associated with them. So we see this um, in parts of our own state, so you know, kind of a semi-arid steppe uh, type of climate uh, that we can see, for example, in much of, across much of eastern Oregon, for example. Um, we, you know, we have that uh, um, observation in much of the western United States uh, as well, just because you know, being on much of the leeward side of mountains um, and kind of just being in a continental location in the middle of a, a continent where you know it's not frequently impacted by lots of uh, moisture. So moving on now to our sea type climates, uh, we have first our Mediterranean. Uh, this as well, uh, hopefully perhaps like somewhat a common one that we have uh, experienced if you're from the west coast of the United States. We see our distributions here um, as aptly named kind of most of this in the world found around the Mediterranean Sea in Europe and North Africa. But once again, um, we see this as well, um, parts of our western coasts, for example, our own North America. And so we see, uh, again, here a more pronounced dry summer period where at least you have part of the year, especially where we can see um, in this example from San Francisco, really no precipitation oftentimes, hardly in the summer months, but it's a little bit more seasonally, very, you know, where we get a few months or where we have a little bit more precipitation that occurs. Again, our temperature range here is actually fairly mild um, and doesn't shift a huge amount throughout that year um, because and we're seeing this subtropical influence still, subtropical high pressure um, that's really strong in those summer months, kind of weakens, allows more low pressure systems kind of get through and uh, bring at least some precipitation oftentimes in more winter months. Um, and so to continue to move, uh, kind of pole word usually is, as we're starting to go now. Um, so now moving into our subtropical regions that are humid. Um, and as you know, that name implies now we're having a much more moisture as we're seeing. Um, so we can see once again, looking at our climate graphs here across the bottom, generally throughout the year, a pretty good amount of moisture, um, generally surplus um, compared to the amount that's evaporating. And again, we'll come back to that concept when we talk about biomes. Um, but, you know, essentially this quite a bit of significant a heat exchange or heat gain or loss uh, now because we have much more moisture. It's going to that latent heat. And usually there's uh, some sort of warm ocean waters or kind of ocean currents nearby in many of those locations as well. Um, that is leading to some influencing in terms of that latent heating, more moisture in the air, not as much temperature range then necessarily as our drier type of climates. Um, similarly, um, we have our oceanic or marine type climates um, that are very similar uh, to what we just looked at uh, with some of these other uh, Mediterranean and our humid continental, or excuse me, humid uh, subtropical, excuse me, we're going to get to humid continental. Um, but our oceanic uh, climates here, again, where we have more just a, not a significant summer dry period like we saw with the Mediterranean climates, so we're getting more constant moisture throughout the year, as we can see here, whether that's fairly low but kind of constant or uh, we can't have more seasonal variation with that, uh, just as we can see on the example on the right here. But again, less temperature variation or to range kind of throughout that year because that more uh, heating, as we just saw with the um, latent heating, uh, and so we see again lots of moisture being supplied uh, in these areas uh, due to you know, them being generally along coastal areas uh, here we, as we see. So uh, then as noted, now we move on to then our humid continental climates. So now again we're, we're continuing to move poleward. Um, we're getting much more variation throughout the year in our insulation. Um, and to note that really we see the humid continental climates and really the climates that we get uh, from now on, mainly these just occurring in the northern hemisphere. So we don't really in the southern hemisphere have a, a large extent of landmass at all that is at higher latitudes there. So really we see this humid continental and other type of D climates um, uh, where our temperature range now becomes moderate to large throughout the year um, you know, in variation because again, we're really only seeing these in, in the northern hemisphere at these high latitudes. So again, as the name implies, because it's humid, we're seeing some heat uh, exchange, that heating or cooling uh, going to latent uh, heat or cooling. And so um, we, within any given month, don't see any, a massive swing necessarily in our temperature range, but again, our temperature range throughout the year 
uh, is uh, varying quite a bit because of that sun angle variation throughout the year. Um, but again, um, we see our temperature, or excuse me, our precipitation really staying fairly constant throughout the year. Um, there's simply some moisture that's being supplied uh, in many of these locations throughout the year to some extent. Um, con in contrast, as we continue to move polar and we get into these subarctic type climates, you know, we're starting to see uh, it's still uh, actually a range in precipitation, as we can see in exa our examples here. Um, we've got more precipitation in this example on the left compared to on the right. We are starting to see a greater temperature range, especially in this example on the right here. We have our uh, Verhoyensk in Russia, known or oftentimes touted as one of the most extreme or in a rain, greatest range of temperatures across months of the year, as we can see here. Um, and you know, really having this uh, large temperature range and generally drier conditions in these places um, for a variety of reasons, for a variety of these same types of reasons that we've seen now in the past. So again, our angle and our, our angle and sun insulation throughout the year kind of varying to quite a large degree and also day length now as we get to especially these higher latitudes um, you know remember our day length is varying quite a lot as well throughout the year uh, with that um, also our continentality uh, of these locations especially with Rohoyansk um, for example on the right here are you know in the middle of continents um, you know the, that land water heating difference we get a lot of variation not a lot of moisture um, again as with humidity and temperature aspects there you know just not a lot of moisture uh, so not a lot of latent heating uh, we'll get a lot more more of that sensible heating of land uh, over that period. And finally, not really, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but polar climates, probably as we can think, you know, they are generally found at the poles. Um, in most locations, are very high uh, uh, elevations, and that's really actually where we're going to. Highland climates they are usually designated out. In our polar climates, as we can think, just because of you know, being at the poles, uh, the range of insulation. Um, is really the main factor in just a low sun angle throughout the year, um, if at all. Of course, part of these these areas spending half of the year oftentimes in complete darkness um, because of our um, sun angle. Remember. So finally, we have our highland climates, um, and this is where now we're seeing um, you know kind of we can have a range of uh, climates that are varying uh, here based on really what the latitude sets uh, for the low elevation climate. So for example, if we're in the tropics, you know, we're at a low latitude. Uh, for example, our Andes Mountains in the uh, in South America, you know, where we have a low latitude, we can have you know, at the base of our mountain a tropical type climate. And we'll actually see kind of a variety of these, all these types of climates that we just saw as we um, you know, traversed latitude. We can also have essentially being ranging in this vertical aspect uh, you know, up the mountain. Um, that is essentially kind of quite similar as we just saw through the walkthrough of all of our types of climates. We might even have like a polar type of climate at a very, very high uh, elevation. Um, you know, and kind of on the opposite side of our mountain here, of course, having more drier type of conditions and a rain shadow, for example. And so uh, a famous geographer back in the 1800s, uh, kind of one person who's touted as one of the first academic type of geographers um, we have here Al Alexander von Humboldt, who was a, you know, came to South America and really, you know, was uh, an explorer who uh, mapped a lot of South American mountains in terms of the Andes and showed that was the first to show this as an example in the Andes. But of course, we really see this across uh, the world in a variety of mountain type of landscapes, which is show an example of how that uh, we came to know this uh, at first. Um, but again, this is really all set on our latitude, right, if our latitude sets the low elevation climates, if, you know, we're talking about a much higher latitude location, for example, in Alaska, you know, Mount Denali, um, you know, really at that high latitude, we're seeing a much less range or, you know, types of our climates, you know, because even at the base of the mountain, you might only have those D type climates because it's already quite cold um, because of a high latitude. And so there's only, you know, really the microthermal and or polar climates that we see there um, so that range that we saw in our lower latitudes. So again, that's our exploration, or kind of, you know, showing off, going through our whole range of climates across the Earth, um, and the Keppen type of classification system. And that's important. Again, thinking about those processes, always wants to be thinking about those processes that are going to be tying back to 
are climate types.